never spoken during a thunderstorm before and I've asked John or indeed any of you but John as host to interrupt me at any point if you can't uh, hear what I'm saying or if indeed I'm speaking um, uh, too slowly the connection can some, sometimes play uh, a, a very difficult factor in all this just to give you I'm going to give you some PowerPoint slides so you'll uh, uh, won't have to stare at me the whole time um, but just to give you a, a brief um, overview of what we're going to cover uh, I am going to tell you a little bit about my story I do believe the most powerful thing the most unique thing that we each have that God gives us is our journey of faith our journey with him and that includes the ups and the downs and mine has been quite a difficult journey I've written about it in my book which you can see me presenting there along with some research which I'm also going to talk on if I've got time I'm going to talk briefly about the, the two major reasons why this topic is so important for us three of the areas which I think um, we need to answer and three of the reasons why we find this so difficult to answer and then um, I'm open to telling you as many stories or as few as you like about what happened in Rome uh, last November or in uh, or indeed in October I was there a few times but a little bit about me as Colm has already said I was born actually I was born in in Barnstable in Devon my father was an RAF fighter pilot uh, that's um, uh, me the elder of um, uh, the two of us me and my sister with my mum and dad and we uh, came back to Guernsey uh, when I was four, uh, five years old. Uh, my father is a Guernsey man. It had been his dream to take us back to the island. Um, and I have to be honest, I tr grew up um, not knowing, if I'm honest, that people could be gay. I was a, I suppose, a bit of a tomboy, as people would say. That's me in the middle there trying to play the angel Gabriel. And, uh, you know, my extent was I thought Gabriel was a girl. It took me quite a long time to understand that actually Gabriel in the Bible is a male name. And our understanding of gender, identity, sexuality, I think certainly for those of us who are in the sort of over 50 or dare I say even over 40 camp, was really confined by the stereotypes which we grew up with. And in a little island like Guernsey, which is very conservative, you can imagine uh, there was no room for difference. I'm fortunate to have had a strong faith most of my life. On the top right there is the little Methodist chapel where my uh, mother and I and my sister and sometimes my dad went. Uh, Methodism on the island is a very, um, basically all the locals go to the Methodist chapel, all the English folk go to the Anglican church. And so I also sang on a Sunday in the town church, which was like our cathedral. Uh, that's on the bottom left. And at the same time, I got very involved with the charismatic movement. Our youth, um, uh, youth, work was very, youth work was very active. We formed something called the God Squad. And in fact, we got so, um, I suppose, alternative that the charismatic movement really swept through the island that we were asked to leave the Methodist church and we set up the first house church. And I was um, and am a charismatic evangelical. And I suppose growing through um, my teenage years, I just believed that God would help me meet the right person at the right time, but somehow the lights would dim and this man would come across the uh, horizon and the music would play and I'd fall madly in love. And sadly that just never seemed to happen. And I couldn't, I just thought there was something wrong with me if I'm honest. Um, um, if I, I, many of you may know that at the time, I suppose particularly in the media being gay, uh, was something as, a, as seen as either an item of ridicule or something very strong. There were no role models, uh, hardly for men and certainly none for women at all. And so when I eventually fell in love, um, I was working in Paris. I'd been to Cambridge, uh, had all those years single and uh, searching, if you like, to be loved and be loved. I finally fell in love when I was in Paris and I found myself in a hell of a dilemma, to coin a phrase. My faith said that this was wrong. It was un an abomination and unacceptable. My heart yearned to love and be loved. And I found myself faced with a, a huge chasm of a, um, if you like, of a dilemma. I moved back to England. Um, I had been very fortunate. I've had quite a career. There's probably not time to go into that, but uh, I've managed things like Fairy Liquid and uh, Lenore. I've been the head of European um, feminine care and clean, which is basically simplicity sanitary towels or Kleenex toilet tissues. I've, I've managed them all. And I came back to England in 1996 to be head of marketing at the BBC. 
And I thought that falling in love with a woman was just a French thing. Um, nothing had happened of it. I tried to talk to her about it. She refused to talk to me ever again. And I decided it was time I came back to England, you know, sat, settled down, got myself sorted. And um, very fortunately for me, I won a ticket, can you believe it, on Concorde, as you do. Uh, I travelled an awful lot with British Airways in those days. I was head of Europe and or very senior in the European team. And so I decided that instead of going on Concorde, I asked if I could swap it. I really regret, it's one of the major regrets of my life, but if I could swap it for a ticket uh, to Australia. And so I went scuba day diving down in Australia. There's a, sorry, I'm probably going into too much of a story here, but I found myself on a boat um, for two weeks sharing a cabin with another lady that I found myself falling head, hook, line and sink to. Obviously nothing that I was going to act on or do, but I knew those feelings were very real. Came back to England, thought I, it was time I found a nice man to try and settle down with. And did indeed find a, a wonderful gentleman who was the conductor of an orchestra I was playing for. But this woman who I had shared the cabin with, um, very um, um, all above board, came to stay with me in London. And I realised that my feelings for her and my attraction to her uh, was of a completely different scale to what it was to this very eligible, very lovely gentleman called Jeff. And that triggered, sadly, a massive breakdown. Um, it was a problem that I couldn't name to anyone. To actually talk about it, to admit that this was something I was struggling with, to me seemed the most impossible thing ever. It would put me on the theological naughty step for the rest of my life. And more importantly, I just did not believe it was the right thing to be doing from a faith point of view. And my faith was so central to my life, I just couldn't understand why God had created me with a desire to love and be loved if the fruit of that love, if the object of that love rather, was something that was wrong and sinful. And so I ended up going uh, sadly into the Cromwell. I was rushed into the hospital there uh, with undiagnosed abdominal pain. I was told that I was exceptionally stressed. I knew what the cause was. I had a complete breakdown and found myself in the Priory, which is a uh, a hospital for those suffering all sorts of mental illnesses, indeed also addiction. And the Priory decided that I was um, a love addict. Oh dear, I think that might be the picture of, yeah, sorry, of me and the Pope falling to the ground, but there we go. Well, um, hopefully that's just the thunder and lightning happening. Um, so I, I um, yes, I, I, I found myself in hospital. I had an extreme encounter with God, which I will talk to you about at the end, but I knew that despite this very dark period that God was walking with me, I won't say all my troubles ended there, but instead after coming out of hospital, I found myself thrown quite literally, and it's in itself is an extraordinary story, into the heart of the Church of England. I saw in a newspaper an advert for something called the Archbishop's Council, which Lord Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury on your left there, was setting up back in 1998. And they were encouraging people from uh, the general public to apply. And I remember looking at this ad and thinking that was the last thing I ever wanted to do. But sometimes God puts us in situations which A, we can never dream of, and B, that we wouldn't uh, actually seek. And it's an extraordinary story of grace and indeed perhaps of favour. But I found myself being one of the um, six people who were appointed to this group of 19, which oversaw the strategy and the policy for the Church of England, headed by both archbishops, Archbishop of Canterbury and York, and with all the most senior members of the Church of England. Uh, George Carey uh, retired and Baroness um, uh, Lord Williams, um, Rowan Williams, took on the role. Um, but that put me in a, a very significant place, I suppose, particularly as an evangelical. I was uh, known as a very senior evangelical in the Church of England. And I knew I had this dark, if you like, secret that the thing that was at the core of my being was that I was attracted to women. Um, and I tried to bury that, if, I, if I'm honest, to begin with. I was also working with two figures you might know, Canon Andrew White. I set up his foundation uh, in the Middle East and worked with him in Israel, Palestine and in Iraq. And I was also working and traveling with Baroness Caroline Cox, um, who is a huge human rights uh, activist, and I'd set up her charity too. 
Now, I realized that I needed help and um, that I frankly felt I needed a lot of prayer ministry. And I think it's what we would call conversion therapy today. But I put myself through six years of active prayer ministry, to be honest, 10, if you count all the years before that of me privately playing with uh, close friends. But during this time on the Archbishop's Council, and indeed working with these two wonderful individuals, I travelled the world meeting all sorts of uh, extraordinary individuals within the evangelical world, and asking them to pray with me quietly, because I was uh, suffering from what we would call same-sex attraction. Um, well, actually, we didn't call it that then. We just called it, I, I thought I was, um, well, some people would say I, I was, um, I needed deliverance. Some people would say I needed emotional healing. I spent years going through every aspect of my life, trying to find a reason why I uh, was suffering from the, the attractions that I did. And I suppose that brought me into all sorts of places. I met uh, Caroline, um, Billy Graham's daughter, and Lots Graham. I, I was um, very active in the HTB um, New Wine movements. And as I say, I went through all sorts of programs. And, and I think if I could have a T-shirt that said, I have tried it every form that's legal of conversion therapy, I, I had got it. And I must admit, I actively thought I had been healed. Um, to be honest, I think I was just very closed down. I, again, expected God to hopefully introduce me to someone, but that never happened. And I came off council. I, um, I actually went on retreat uh, down to Lee Abbey in, in Devon and sat waiting for God to give me instructions, if you like, as to what was to happen next. I had a sense that there was a massive chapter change about to happen. I'd rather radically sold my house I'd put everything in storage and I was waiting to hear what was to come of me next. I, I had a step back from my work with both Andrew and Caroline and I found myself, I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you're desperate uh, to hear from God. You put yourself in a place of retreat, you clear everything else out of your life and you sit and you wait and there's nothing. And it's one of the most frustrating things, I think, in the world. And uh, for me, I was very fortunate. I had a good friend um, uh, who had offered me her spare room in Oxford. Uh, she knew me well. She had worked as um, a secretary to George Carey. And she had also she moved to Oxford. And she said, Jane, if you ever get stuck for somewhere uh, to live, do come and use my spare room for a bit. So I asked if I could um, uh, use that. And, uh, and on the first night, she cooked me a lovely supper and said, you know, how did it go down in, uh, in your retreat place in Leanne? And I said, well, I didn't anything. I said, except for the fact that I had a real appetite to read about international relations and God and the role of religion. And I remember looking at me and I, I well, I said to her, can I use the library, do you think, here in Oxford? And she said, well, have you thought about studying it? And I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. I, I, um, uh, I was fascinated by the, the role that international religion had in international relations. It's something I'd obviously learned a lot about from Caroline Cox and Canon Andrew White. And um, to cut a long story short, I went to the university and asked them if I could join one of their master's programs. I was very late in the year. And they suggested that I might want, with my experience, to join something called the Foreign Service Programme. That was a programme for diplomats from around the world. A slight problem wasn't a diplomat and I wasn't from overseas, but hey, God can do things when he wants to. And I did this course um, and on it I met an extraordinary woman who was a diplomat. And within the first few weeks, I realized that all the previous eight years of conversion therapy prayer had not worked and that I was back where I had been 15 years before, falling in love with what I perceived as forbidden fruit. And that took me, I'm afraid, again, to a very, very dark place. I felt I would tried everything. I tried living a single and celibate life. And frankly, it had taken me to a place where I did not want to carry on. I uh, was desperate, if I'm honest, to die. I would never take my life, but I saw no reason and no hope 
I'm afraid to say, to carry on. God hadn't answered my prayers. I had sought healing. I couldn't cope with the loneliness and the hopelessness of being on my own. And so I decided I had to take the only choice I could see, which was to try and bravely step out and investigate if the one thing that I yearned for, which was to be loved by a woman, actually brought me the hope and healing that I sought. I, I'll be honest with you and say I really thought I was walking away from God at that point. I'd like to say I had a wonderful revelation that it was all fine. I didn't. But I believe that God would love me regardless, because that is what the Bible had taught me. But much to my amazement, um, I, I very fortunately uh, met a, an extraordinary woman uh, very shortly after that. We met online. Uh, we fell in love. And my world turned technicolor. And more importantly, everybody could see that my world had put, turned technicolor, whether I wanted to tell them or not. When you meet someone who's in love, there is no stopping them. I just, I mean, I hope most of you have experienced the joy of being in love. It's being hit like a bus. You can't control it. You can't squash it. Your life becomes full of happiness, joy, peace, all the gifts of the spirit. And through an extraordinary uh, work of grace, and again, I can go into this in questions if you like later, and I've written extensively now on this, I went back and sought why I had believed what I had in the Bible. I started meeting and talking with others who'd been on a similar journey, and I began to realize a lot of the um, law that I had read into scripture rather than the love. I began to look at the translations of certain texts and the implications of our culture and understanding on many of them. But more importantly, I saw God at work in my life in the same miraculous way that he had always worked, or she, uh, depends how you pronoun God, in my life up to that point. Now, I have to be honest and say, my relationship with church was in a very difficult place. I mean, when I did come out and I was helped by Bishop James Jones, I um, wrote uh, privately to all the senior evangelicals I had been working with and indeed the people on the Archbishop's Council and beyond. And I was dropped like a stone um, by, I'm afraid to say, most of my friends, uh, most of the senior leaders who didn't know what to say. And it was a very difficult time, but I was loved through it by a partner who walked and held my hand and made it worthwhile. Now, sadly, uh, we lasted six years. Um, I think if you bring two people together in their 40s and with no experience of relationship and no support and no and huge expectations, it can run into buffers at times. And sadly, ours did. And I regret that. But um, at the same time, I, I stepped out of church for a bit. I needed to recalibrate, rethink. And then slowly and surely, my local vicar here in... Um, in Littlemore in Oxford, in the parish where John Henry Newman built the church, the Anglican church, and gave his last sermon before he became a Catholic. That little local church run by a wonderful woman committed to the poor in our area. We have a very poor di um, uh, postcode, of huge single parents, drug related issues. And she literally loved me back to life. She didn't know anything about my past or my um, or what positions I'd held within the church. She had a very traditional sort of high Catholic view of life. And I, at first time, found that quite hard, but I found a community that welcomed and embraced and loved me. I stood out like a sore thumb, not because I was gay, but because I was from the big house on the corner and I was from a different social class and I was white and I was, relatively well off compared to everybody else but I was loved and accepted and gradually um, I knew that deep down at some point I would have to re-engage with the church I knew that my relationships with the um, bishops with the archbishops with uh, the evangelical world was no coincidence and I really felt that God uh, at the right time would show me how and when to re-engage and therefore, in 2014, which is actually six years ago now, I uh, actually started engaging with the General Synod again. I got voted back onto General Synod. 
um, I started leading all sorts of debates and uh, discussions within both the Church of England and indeed within the evangelical community to the point that at, as Colm has shared with you, I, um, I was approached by the Bishop of Liverpool there, that's for Bishop Paul Bayes, uh, and some other very senior Anglicans, the Dean of St Paul's Cathedral, David Ison and others, who wanted to come around me and, and create a charity to help fund my work. I'd been uh, living on a wing and a prayer, quite literally. And uh, we started that in 2017, it became a charity in 2018. And uh, at the same year, I found myself being approached uh, to stand for uh, this, uh, the government's LGBT advisory panel. And I was appointed to that last year. That's me with Penny Mordant and various other members. We can talk more about that in a minute. But why have I got so engaged? And I hope, I mean, some of this you will know, and uh, I hope it, uh, some of the statistics may or may not uh, be useful to you and I've just realized I've, I'm afraid I've lo loaded the wrong slides which is slightly un uh, embarrassing for me. I'm about to share you some, some your, your uh, attitude in Ireland, I know it's quite different to same-sex marriage, I've just rerun this survey so we've actually got 2020 results as well but what we've seen in the UK is a massive and swift change as indeed you have seen in Ireland of people believing that same-sex marriage is right. Now, obviously, same-sex marriage is way along the discussion line for most in the church. They're still trying to work out if we're going to the heaven or hell, uh, and then they might recognize, well, it's okay to be gay, but don't act on it, and don't uh, think of, of, of partnering, and if you do partner, don't get married. So same-sex marriage is right at the end of that spectrum. But when I ran, uh, ran this uh, survey with YouGov, I asked uh, various profiling questions around their age and indeed around their uh, faith and their denomination. And as you'd expect, obviously, the younger you are, the blue uh, figures, the more likely you are to uh, think um, in an accepting, inclusive way. The groups that we found, and it won't be any surprise, and I'd love to know uh, what the, well actually I can tell you what the figures are for Catholic and I'm very sorry I didn't upload the Catholic figures they are available on my website ozan www.ozanfoundation. sorry ozan.foundation I'll give it to you at the end but these are the Anglican figures and obviously Anglican men um, tend on the whole to be less accepting um, than women and perhaps more importantly Anglican men over 55 are the group who are the least accepting in the UK. So the older you are and the more Anglican you are, uh, and, and sadly, if you're male, sorry to, it is a, there is definitely a gender split here. But the point I often point out to uh, uh, my Anglican colleagues is who makes up the House of Bishops, or indeed within the Catholic Church, who makes up your I don't know, cardinal group, it tends to be the older male men, in your case it is only older male men, who have got the most conservative attitudes. And therefore whilst the congregation and the people in the pews and certainly the younger members of our church are in a very different place, it is those in authority who are making those decisions which impact them all. Now interestingly what I found this year when I did the survey was um, the Catholic attitude uh, if I can be put it, I mean, obviously it's in, the, it's in England rather than in Ireland, but was far more accepting than the Anglican one. And, and, I, uh, and I shared those results with the tablet because I thought it was quite interesting. And again, it was Irish uh, Catholic women who were far, far more accepting than any other profile group. So the first reason is our mission. How do we speak, sorry, to a nation when they're in such a different place? Our second reason is because of the pastoral care issue of the actual impact on the LGBT community and I can um, I can give you lots of statistics which are just horrific about the level of suicide, the level of harm, the level of depression amongst those who, um, particularly young people, who find themselves being rejected. I know the stories of uh, sadly of many people who have taken their lives Perhaps the most notable in the UK is the very sad story of Lizzie, who took her life at the age of 14. She was in an evangelical church, who actually, sadly, the vicar was actually very accepting, but she assumed that he would judge her. She assumed 
that she would never be able to have a family and she hung herself um, one night. I'm very close to her parents. Uh, we work, they have spoken out very bravely and courageously in order to try and challenge the church and its teachings. And she is a, a name and a voice um, which I hope, and the memory of whom I hope will never die. But to try and put these figures, if you like, within a faith context, I ran a survey in 2018, which you can find on my website or by uh, noting this bit.ly um, uh, tag down, where we asked people across the board um, in England uh, of all ages, uh, of all faiths and none, about questions to do with their faith and their sexuality. And I had an oversight board, which uh, I, I tried to make as robust as possible because I knew people would um, question the veracity of the research. So I had Professor Sir Bernard Silverman, a former president of the Statistical Society, the Bishop of Manchester, who was the lead bishop on statistics and various other key figures across the faith groups and across the church. And I'm just going to share a couple of the figures. So again, all these figures are available online. But conversion therapy is still being practiced in our churches and across religions and in society today. Um, uh, of the four and a half thousand people who replied, we had about 20% who'd said that they'd been advised to consider, 15% who voluntarily considered it, and perhaps very concerningly, three and a half percent, 76 people who'd been forced through conversion therapy. It was uh, by far and away the religious leaders and the religious context that was doing that forcing and doing that advising to go through conversion therapy. And sadly, the age, I'm going to do these very quickly, the age um, uh, was very young. Obviously, people were coming to terms of their sexuality in their teenage years, over half of people had been under 18. Um, if you take and, and another third uh, under the age of 25, we're therefore dealing with a safeguarding issue. And why had they gone through conversion therapy? Well, you can see the reasons. These are the primary reasons. 72% believing it was sinful. They wanted to live a straight life. They were ashamed. All forms that their religious leader disapproved. All issues to do with their faith and the conflict with their faith. And uh, did it work? Well, you won't be surprised. 75% said no. 15% said it worked and then it wore off. That's my testimony. A few still believe it worked, but the vast majority said it didn't work. And the impact on their health and their mental health was significant. Of those who said they had mental health issues, two thirds had had suicidal thoughts and 60%, sorry, um, where is it? Yes, a third had attempted suicide. These are just horrific findings. And it's these findings I presented to Pope Francis back in November. It's um, perhaps as, as um, Colm has, has mentioned, uh, I led a debate within the Church of England, which ended with the Church of England and all, supported by all the bishops calling on the government to ban. And that is something I've been working with them on and still trying to get there, hoping to hear very soon whether we will have an actual ban of conversion therapy in the UK and indeed around the world is something I'm trying to work on. How are we doing for time, jo um, John, Colm? Have I got about another 10 minutes or I don't know who to look at? You could yeah, just... you're, you've got about 10 minutes thereabouts. Yeah, yeah so tell me when. Well, I'll do this very, very quickly. Sorry. So some of the questions I often get asked and again, I can point you to, you know, is it a question of orientation? How, you know, a lot of people still believe that you aren't born gay, that you become gay. And there is so much research now that, um, that, that from all the academics, the medical, the, the scientists who will explain that no, um, orientation is not something you can change. It is something innate in you. I ran a big conference uh, with a mixture of academics and personal people. Again, it's on my website. You can download all the papers about how sexuality is, is normally formed in the womb. This is not something you can seek to change. Okay, so say many in the church, well then you have to be single and celibate for life. And I believe that that is A, unbiblical, because both Christ and St. Paul uh, talk about celibacy being a gift, and only for those who can bear it. It is not something that you have to demand of people who just want to love and be loved. So I, I, we can go into the question of celibacy later. 
And then you'll get people who will talk about um, the fact that their identity is not being gay or being bi, or, but their identity is in Christ and that they suffer same-sex attraction. Now, I would be the first to say that my identity is very much in Christ, but part of who I am happens to be the wonderful uniqueness of the way I'm created is that I am created fearfully and wonderfully, but with an attraction for women which I need to celebrate and, and embrace. God doesn't make mistakes. And some of our theology about, uh, dare I say, about disability, about ethnicity, about gender, sometimes seems to think that we have a, a sort of, you know, what I call a white supremacy of, unless you're, you know, blonde, blue eyed with wonderful teeth and uh, very fit and sporty, you don't quite fit the mold. And that is not the world that God has created. He loves us equally, as I'm sure you'll agree, but has created us each individually. And our identity is indeed in Christ, but it actually does reflect our difference too. I'm, I'm speeding too quickly. Three challenges, certainly within the Church of England, and I think they map very well, if I may, into the Catholic Church. Speaking out has become um, a real challenge to many. I know many, many senior church leaders of all denominations, indeed many religious leaders around the world who have changed their mind on this, who are pastorally very challenged by this, who will take, sit me down and say, Jane, I'm with you. I just can't tell anybody I'm with you. Because the moment I do, the moment that I start um, getting, um, you know, left by um, people. And so, um, and those tribes can be denominational, they can be in the domination within the evangelical world. And uh, the fear of rejection, of, of putting one's head up, is something I'm desperately trying to encourage people to deal with. Fear of being wrong. This is a picture from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. What does it say about our theology if we suddenly have to revisit scripture that we've spoken about for so many years? But actually, I think it's terribly biblical to have the courage, as we've done with slavery, as we in the Anglican Church have done with women, as we've done with many things, to admit our bias and that God has a bigger picture of humanity. And then there's the whole question of disunity, that um, Christ calls us to be one, that we can't say anything that will rip the body. Certainly within the Anglican communion, I'm told that I'm risking pulling it all apart. And my comment to that is, what sort of unity do we have at the moment, which is forced on people, many of whom have left and who indeed are leaving? They may not be large evangelical churches, they may be not be large, if you like, provinces, but they are individuals deeply hurt. And I think we have a false understanding of unity where you, it's a bit like a marriage where you are forced to stay together where there is no love. That to me is not the unity that Christ talked about. So you'll hear me talking a lot about the truth about unity and how actually unity has to be a fruit and never a goal. But the one thing I suppose the picture I want to leave you with, uh, let alone the picture picture, is that God, I truly believe, has a plan. I, I'm sure you'll agree with that too. He, God has a, is a God of surprises who takes us into places that we least anticipate or expect. I didn't even know or understand that I had been invited to meet the Pope. I was asked if I'd like to go to Mass at Santa Marta. I was in Rome. And I said, well, that's terribly kind, but I'm not a Catholic. Um, can we just go for dinner? And my friend who I, uh, is a lovely story, is a friend I was meeting from Argentina who knows Pope Francis very well, sort of raised his eyebrows and said, well, okay, fine, if you just want to go to dinner. And when I arrived in Rome, I had a meeting with the UK ambassador to the Holy See, and she was giving me a briefing about the Vatican. And she mentioned the phrase Santa Marta. And I stopped her. I said, do you mind me asking where Santa Marta is? I can't find it on the map anywhere. I don't know what it is. And she smiled. She said, well, that's the Pope's residence, Jane. And my face dropped. And she said, oh, my goodness, have you been invited? And I said, well, yes, but I've turned it down because I didn't realise that, I suppose for us, it's like Canterbury or Lambeth Palace. I didn't know that that's what it was. She said, ah, oh, 
we might want to revisit that. So I, I, um, I did speak to my friend again, apologised terribly for not understanding and asked if this invitation was still standing. So I had to fly back to Rome uh, a few days later and was very privileged and, and, and grateful to be able to have a few minutes where I could talk about the impact that the church is teaching. In fact, exactly what I said was the ch church has taught me that I could never be a mother, a grandmother or a wife. And that is why I went through conversion therapy and it nearly killed me. This is my story. And this research shows that I am not alone and that there are thousands of others, mostly children who are going through this now. And we need your help, Papa. And uh, it was longer than we mostly took both my hands. And, you know, as you will probably know, every word is recorded and um, weighed and measured so it's very difficult for him to say things at these sort of times but you can hear and sense a lot just by the eyes by the hands by the love by the way that he grabbed both my eyes looked into my sorry grabbed both my hands and looked into my eyes and said pray for me please and i promise to pray for you and thank you for these he could have just shrugged me off and knocked on, but uh, I was then invited a few days later to um, back to the Vatican where I was able to sit and listen to him give a speech uh, to a group of lawyers into which he inserted a paragraph talking about the evils of leaders who ch used their position to, um, uh, to, to be prejudiced against and to, and to give harm to the uh, gay community. And he specifically wanted to speak out on that. We've got an awful long way to go, but at least a bridge and an opportunity to talk and influence and hopefully pray that things can be different. Thank you. Right. Um, I've written some books. There are copies in Ireland if you want any. Let me know. I've got friends who've got some thereabouts or you can follow me. Um, sorry if that's gone over a little bit. But, um, how do we do the next? You have oh, you. look at you. Thank you. <laughs> you haven't nice. gone over time at all, Jane. You're, 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 you're great. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Thank, thank you. Very, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do you need a little break? Can you hear me? Could you, yeah. could, was, the, was yeah. the sound okay? Well, praise God for that one. <laughs> this, this is only water. It's not gin and tonic, honestly. <laughs> do you need a little break? Or do no, you, I'm do fine. You, you're happy for, have, have I'm you very know, fine. Crack thank on you. with some questions. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording now. So just again, I suppose worth saying to people that